So as we continue with Machine 2.0 Explained, we've had a look at the basic overview of our software functions, and we've also had a look at the new Machine Studio hardware unit as well, and some of its features. And now we're going to continue looking at the Machine 2.0 software and all of the new panels, buttons, and functions. So we're going to start over here on our left, and we click the Machine logo, and we're going to get the Machine pop-up indicating what version we're on. It's also showing us we're in 64-bit mode and it has our list of fabulous developers here from Native Instruments. Next to that, we have the drop-down arrow, which gives us the same file, edit view, and controller menus that we have explored in the top menu bar in a previous tutorial. If you are in full screen mode, for example, you won't be able to access the top menu bar. So here's where you'll be able to access those functions. The magnifying glass, opens and closes the browser section. So you have a bit more control over your screen real estate as you're working. And also note that the F4 function key on your keyboard actually activates that browser button as well. We have our play from start button, our play button, and our record button. And next to that, we have our metronome on and off switch right here. If you remember when we were in preferences, we also had the metronome on and off toggle, which corresponded to this switch up here in the transport bar. Here we have our BPM settings here, and we can click and drag up and down with our mouse, or we can actually double click and enter the values manually. Here we have our swing percentage for adding swing to our sounds or our groups, and we can click and drag up as well, all the way to 100 and come back down to vary the amount of swing that we're gonna be adding. Next, we have our time signature, 4-4 timing, most commonly used in pop music. And of course, we can change it to 3 fourths. That's like a waltz timing or, you know, 6 eighths or anything in between, depending on what you're doing. And you can see that the grid changes as you adjust the time signature as well below. Okay. Next, we're going to move on to our transport counter right beside it. And you can see here, it shows the position of our cursor. And if we actually click and drag with the mouse, you can see we actually move our cursor along the timeline as well. So that's our transport indicator right there. Now beside that, we have our follow cursor switch, turning that on and off, of course, keeps our cursor in view on the timeline. And we can toggle back and forth depending on how we want it to react. Up next, we have the auto scroll on and off switch. And to best show how this works, we're gonna make a few more scenes right here. We're gonna just hit the plus sign and add three scenes and change the loop length. The next thing that we're gonna do is actually just shrink our viewable area. So scene three is out of view. And we're gonna press play and see what happens to the cursor first with the auto scroll button in the off position. And as we see it going, it goes off the screen and we don't see it come back until it cycles past scene three. Now, if we turn on the auto scroll and press play, and now we have a look at the behavior of the cursor. And as you can see, it updates the screen wherever the cursor is at any given point in time. So that's how the auto scroll feature works. Sometimes if you're editing a section of your song and you want to stay focused, you might not want the auto scroll to be continuously changing your playback position on screen. And other times you may want to keep a track of exactly where you are in your song at all times as your sequence is running. Okay. Now here we see something that says 16ths. And at first you might think this is the quantize function. If you open the menu, you see it says off, one bar, half, quarter, eighth, 16th and scene. What this actually does is change the behavior of the timing when you're jumping around with the cursor inside of a scene or anywhere in your project, or if you're selecting scenes from the hardware controller. Basically put whatever value you set, if you jump around with your cursor in the timeline, it takes the requisite time to respond to make a change in your sequence. Similar to how Ableton Live deals with their timing as you move around in their transport window. And we're gonna see that a little bit later as we go along. Now we have the re-trigger button and we toggle it on and off like this, and you see the check mark. The retrigger button is gonna determine the behavior of your scenes when you're triggering them live. If you have retrigger on, you can trigger the same scene over and over for a start, stop, stutter kind of effect. And if you leave it off, that makes sure that you can't accidentally trigger the same scene while it's playing on top of itself. And we're gonna demonstrate this as we go along using the hardware controller to show you exactly how this works in practice. Now next we have this icon right here, which actually switches the machine hardware from whatever mode it's in back into the sound edit screen. So let's have a look at the machine studio controller for the very first time. And here it is. 
And as you can see, if we put it into mix mode, for example, let's now press the button with our mouse and you can see it changes and sends it back into sound edit mode. Okay, so that's just a sneak preview. We'll be looking at the controller in more detail as we go along. Now, moving on to the right, we have our level meter and we can actually control our level volume with the software by grabbing the pointer with the mouse and moving it up and down just like this. And then we have our CPU meter as well that shows us how much CPU we're consuming with our project. Next to that, we have a power button on and off. And you might think it's a little bit strange at first, but actually it's a really neat way to just disable machine altogether without having to power down the software or power down your unit. Maybe you're playing live, you're on a break, you don't want to accidentally hit the pads when you're not supposed to. You can just turn the power button off and it renders everything disabled. No audio, no transport functions until you're ready to go again and you turn it back on. And finally, our NI icon once again that brings up our machine flash screen. So there you have it. That's a look at the functions of the transport bar across the top of your software. Next, we're going to continue and have a look at the newly designed browser section and how to navigate through your library and all your files on your system. So thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the next tutorial.